historic aspect of Christianity, and that's the legacy of singing and singing praise to God Almighty. And I trust that we will never take that for granted in the opportunity that we have to sing God's praise. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We're still working our way through the Sermon on the Mount and the teaching of Jesus Christ from Matthew's Gospel. Matthew chapter 5, and you'll see there we'll be looking at verses 38 through 42. Or if you're using one of the uh, pew Bibles there in front of you, it's on page 963. I am grateful that you're here today, and I don't know about you, but sometimes on Sunday, just the opportunity to sing God's praise, fellowship with believers, and hear from His Word is just one of those, ah, you ever have those weeks? And it's just good to be together with others who are worshiping God and, and the opportunity that we have, and that's why I said earlier, I trust that we'll never take that for granted. As we're looking at Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 through 42, we've been looking at a sermon series called The Heart of the Matter, because it is the heart that God is concerned with, the heart of each and every human being. And as we hear the words of Christ today, I trust that we'll be mindful first and foremost of our own heart. God hasn't called you to change anyone else's heart. In fact, if you haven't realized it yet, you're still living in that frustration of trying to change someone else's heart, that is frustrating. That is not what you're called to do. What you're called to do is to continue to surrender and grow in your relationship with God through Jesus Christ so that your own heart is changed. And so I trust that today, not just because it's the title of our sermon series, but I trust that today we'll allow the Holy Spirit to examine our own hearts in light of God's holy word. So Matthew chapter 5, I want to begin reading. In verse 38, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you. And do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again, we bow before you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we're grateful that we can come to your throne through Christ and ask that today the Holy Spirit would teach us truth from your word. Father, help us to see and understand and live. God, change our hearts according to your truth. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ that I pray. Amen. Probably even if you haven't been in church, you've heard the expression, turn the other cheek. It's not an unusual expression in our culture. But I wonder what your response is. And I mean deep down inside. What is your response? What, what does your heart feel? What does your heart sense when you hear that? I think a lot of times, most human beings, our initial instinct is to say, well, wait a minute, I got to take care of number one first. Um, that's American culture, not biblical directive, in case that's your first thought. <laughs> okay? In fact, there's no place in the Bible that says you're to take care of number one first. The Bible makes clear there's only one number one, it's Jesus Christ. And that we, as followers of Him, or if you claim to be a follower of His, you surrender to him first, even as the Bible teaches to the point of laying down your own life. We say, well, Pastor John, how can you say that? I'm not telling you to lay down your own life. I'm asking you to check the priorities in your heart. Because most Americans that I know, their response to turn the other cheek goes something like this. That ain't going to happen. No. Nope. I'm not letting anybody get one up on me, okay? I, I mean, I'm just paraphrasing, but that's the way most Americans are going to respond. Let's be clear. Jesus Christ is not teaching that you're to let anyone physically abuse you. That is not 
the teaching here. And the key is in verse 39. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. So when he says, turn the other cheek, he's making certain that we understand it's coming from an evil perspective. Okay? So it has nothing to do with if you're being physically abused, hanging around and continuing to let someone beat on you. No. No, that, that has nothing to do with the context here. And so I trust that as we look at this again, Jesus is not addressing physical abuse. And yet I want us to examine our own hearts with this idea of not only our thought of, I'm not going to let that person do this to me, but I'm going to get them back. And so let's focus on that this morning. See, the desire for revenge is a heart issue. Jesus quotes the law or from the Mosaic law. And he says, you have heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now it's important because most of the time we, because of our American culturalism, don't even take that passage of scripture correctly. What Jesus is saying is, look, revenge is a heart issue because your heart needs to change for you to avoid taking revenge or taking the role of one who would play out vengeance. And it's important that we understand that. There are actually three specific scriptures in the Mosaic Law that use the phrase, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. However, the law of God in these passages has absolutely nothing to do with vengeance. The law of God is laying down an equitable justice instruction. In fact, there's many specifics. If someone kills your donkey, they were supposed to give you a donkey as a result of killing your donkey. So eye for eye, donkey for donkey, tooth for tooth. And so as the Mosaic Law expressed this that Jesus is focusing on, Jesus in his first century audience, as with the 21st century audience today, we rarely see things the way God intends. Because eye for eye, tooth for tooth, is just a matter of equitable justice and that there be no punitive damage beyond what would be equitable. And yet we, like the people Jesus was speaking to, let me see if I can kind of jump into our mindset. That guy knocked out one of my teeth. I'm going to hit him so hard, I'm going to knock out three of his. Resonate with anyone? That's the way the human heart responds to being wronged. Now remember, the context is somebody actually doing something wrong to you. Evil. Jesus was talking about not resisting evil. So yes, it very well could be planned and purposed evil that someone would take a swing at you to knock out your tooth. But I guarantee if you've ever had that happen, probably one of your first thoughts, if not your immediate inclination, is to, what can I do to knock out all of his teeth? That's the heart issue. That's where the human heart is so far from the heart of God. And that's what Jesus is teaching. He uses the example. If somebody slaps you, if somebody sues you, if somebody forces you, like he was using the illustration of a first century Roman guard. And so we must check our own hearts and the tendency of the human heart to repay a wrong with a bigger wrong. And I like to illustrate it like this. He got me here, but I'm going to get him here. And then what's this person going to do? Oh, well, he got me here. I'm going to get him here. And then what does this person do? He got me here. I'm going to get him here. Where does it end? It doesn't. It's an evil cycle of vengeance of which that is to which Christ is speaking. And I got to tell you, our idea of justice is always me coming out on top. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's the human idea of justice. That's what Jesus 
is speaking against. And here's the warning in regards to the heart. The unjust heart is never satisfied. That's why it's this, then this, then this, then this, then this. See, the godless, unjust heart is never satisfied. It's never satisfied. And it goes something like this. You know, I got that person back many years ago. But it still wouldn't bother me if they suffered some more. I mean, you fill in the blank. See what I mean by the human heart is never satisfied? The godless, unjust heart And Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 12. All of these scripture references are listed there in your bulletin, but feel free to turn there if you would like to. I want to read from Romans chapter 12 that deals with this cycle of human vengeance, which is so godless, and it all stems from a godless heart. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 17. Repay no one evil for evil. What was Jesus talking about? When he mentioned eye for eye and tooth for tooth, don't resist evil. He's talking about evil. Paul, the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 12, 17, Repay no one evil for evil. They did you evil. You're going to get them back more evil. (laughs) It's getting serious now. Some of you aren't laughing like you were when we first started. Because it's getting serious. It exposes our own heart. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, catch this, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Remember a few weeks ago when we talked about reconciliation? leaving your gift at the altar, going and making it right with someone. I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but I know of people who have gone to someone else to try to make something right, and that person doesn't receive it, and they don't do anything to make it right. Well, you've done all you can do. Remember what I said at the very beginning? You cannot change anyone's heart. So that's why the Apostle Paul follows this up with, If possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Verse 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Why do you think God calls us not to get in the vengeance business and makes certain that he alone will mete everything out for eternity? Why do you think that is? Well, not only because he will, but he's just. And me and you ain't. That's the shortest way I knew how to say that. Excuse my grammar. Because God is just. And so, yes, we could all list story after story of somebody who was treated unjustly and the unjust evil person got away with it. They will not get away with it. But do you trust the God of justice to carry out that which is truly just? That's important because that's a hard issue. Do you really trust God? Pastor John, you, you just don't know what that person did to me. I don't have to know. If you're responding to evil with evil, you got a heart problem. You got a heart problem. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Apostle Peter writes, Do not repay evil for evil. You, you are aware when the Bible receipt, repeats itself, why it repeats itself? Are you aware? It's a, it's a deep theological issue. You understand why the Bible repeats itself, right? Why is that? What's that? We're thick, and we don't get it the first time. Anybody raise children? Ever repeat yourself to your children? Welcome to God and his children and that world. Okay? When the Bible repeats something, it's repeating it for a special emphasis. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. 
For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. See, any earthly attempt at satisfying our own heart not only will never satisfy us, but when God satisfies the heart, when God makes that change within you, you'll not only be able to be a blessing then to others, you will be blessed. Why don't we take God at his word? Can somebody answer me that? Why don't we take God at his word? We'd rather attempt our own satisfaction of getting that person back than to trust God and his word and knowing that I can actually be a blessing to someone else. See, it's important because that's the hard issue that Jesus is dealing with. A changed heart is blessed. Blessed if by no other means than by the presence of God and Christ. And so it's important that we understand when we go at it with our own unjust, ungodly heart, there will never be satisfaction. See, Jesus gives us then in this teaching from Matthew chapter 5 some specific examples of how to deal with the evil of another. Remember? He, he mentioned that specifically in the context. He said, turn the other cheek. Well, that's difficult for us because, again, if someone was to hit us in the cheek, we would label that as assault. In the first century world, especially the audience to whom Jesus was speaking, maybe you've seen it in some of those old movies where someone takes their glove off and just smacks someone across the face, and then they realize it's time for a duel or whatever. The, okay. That was the context in the first century culture, okay? When someone slapped you in the cheek, they went, weren't taking a full roundhouse punch. They were just trying to get your attention and everyone around to see that they had just insulted you. So our best understanding is that Jesus is teaching about insults. If you don't want to be insulted, stay off social media. Okay, I mean, that's the best advice I know how to give in our culture today. But it amazes, I'm on social media, and those of you who know I'm on social media, I post very, very little. But I find incredible insights to the human nature when I read these long threads of people going back. And it's just like this, he got me, I'm going to get him. He got me, I'm going to get him. And, and, it, and it just stockpiles. Does it not? Okay. So when Jesus was talking about it, he wasn't talking about being physically attacked. He was talking about an insult. And as a result of being insulted, don't insult in return. Now that applies to the rest of you who aren't on social media. Because <laughs> when somebody says something that's insulting to us, we're pretty good at coming right back at him, aren't we? Okay? So don't dismiss this from being applicable to you if you're thinking, well, Pastor John, I'm on, not on social media, so this insult thing doesn't matter to me. No. What Jesus is saying is, when someone insults you, don't return insult with insult. Okay? In fact, if you read on in Romans chapter 12, that idea of being a blessing says when somebody treats you in a way that's bad, love them in return because love overcomes evil. Jesus said it in preparation for this point of his sermon in Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. If you're still there at the Matthew 5 passage, just look back prior in Matthew chapter 5 and what Christ is saying. Blessed are you when others revile you. See, most of us can't get past that. <laughs> most of us cannot get past, he's insulting me. He's saying, he's doing, he's trying to make me look bad. Most of us never get beyond that point because our heart is so hardened in a godless place that we never hear the rest of what Jesus is saying. What does Jesus say? Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely. See, that's what makes it so bad, Pastor John. What they were saying about me wasn't even true. 
Jesus addressed that. <laughs> but look at the caveat. Jesus says on my account. If you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Christ, and people are acting towards you in an evil manner, be it actions or words, simply because you're a follower of Christ, that's persecution. Jesus is saying, if you're being persecuted because of me, you are blessed. The problem is, most of us forget our Christianity, and we just act like knuckleheads, and people who come after us, come after us because we're acting knuckleheaded. That's not persecution. Do you see the difference? Hmm, I don't think many of you do. Because if you speak or act in an ungodly way, that automatically disqualifies you from verse 11. Verse 11 says, if you're treated wrongly on my account, Jesus speaking. So if you just act bad or speak bad and somebody responds in kind, that's on you. And it's on your unchanged heart. Do you see the heart of the matter? So just because you claim to be a Christian, you can be a stupid Christian. <laughs> I know it's true. I'm waiting for the other 99% of you to catch on and catch up. So you're being reviled for your stupidity, not because of your Christianity, when you act like a stupid Christian. It hits hard, and let me tell you why it hits hard, because it digs at the very grain of our sin nature in our hearts. I want you to hang on to that. Verse 12, Jesus says, Matthew 5, not only are you blessed... Does somebody else want to read the first few verses of verse 12? Rejoice and be glad. Rejoice and be glad. And the perspective is not of this world, for it is in heaven. Do you remember what Paul and Silas were doing? When they were wrongfully imprisoned for the sake of Christ, what were they doing, Katie? They were singing praise songs. I think we could qualify that as rejoicing and being glad. They had been beaten. They had been thrown into the jail. All because of Christ. Most of us, I'm going to say all of us, if we get beaten and thrown in jail because of Christ, we're going to be dialing our attorney. And I guarantee you when you get your attorney's fees, you're going to be anything but rejoicing and being glad. No, but do you get the point? Paul and Silas beaten only for the sake of expressing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they were singing songs. They were rejoicing. They were being glad. And the perspective is what the last part of that verse displays. Your reward is great in heaven. An unchanged heart looks for earthly satisfaction and earthly reward. A changed heart realizes this is not my home. I'm just a passing through, like the old song said. And like we mentioned earlier, God's going to settle it all out in the end. Do you live with that kind of trust? Do you live with that kind of rejoicing? So rather than be offended for the cause of Christ, remember, the cause of Christ is the key. We should rejoice that we've been counted worthy to suffer for Christ. So our blessing and rejoicing is in Christ, not in this world. Jesus goes on to talk about the cloak. You know, taking someone's cloak. There was actually a law that was against an Israelite taking another Israelite's cloak. Because the way they dressed in the ancient Middle East, the cloak was the most outer garment. It was usually a little bit heavier and oftentimes at night, and we're, we're experiencing this now in the desert region we live in, there can be a 40 degree swing between night and daytime highs in temperature, right? And so that outer cloak really was their protection from the cool of the night. 
from the cold at night. And so, according to the Mosaic law, as an Israelite, you couldn't even take that from another Israelite. Jesus is saying, give it. If they ask for your shirt, give them your cloak too. Give it to them. Do you trust God that much? Comes back to the heart. The Roman soldiers in the Roman ruled world of Palestine when Jesus was speaking. The Roman soldiers had the right by law to say, hey you, pick up my sword and equipment bag and carry it with me. What did Jesus say? Take it two miles. He wasn't being legalistic. What he was saying was, if someone calls upon you to serve, serve beyond. Be willing. That's an attitude of the heart. Because here's what the unchanged human heart does. Okay, I'll carry it for a mile. And I mean, you click your pedometer, and I mean, that thing rolls over one mile, boom, I'm done. See, that's the way the human heart sees things and acts in response. That's not the godly heart. Oh, brothers and sisters, that our hearts need to be changed. Same thing with the instruction to be generous and the idea that we should give. In fact, you know what the Bible says in Paul's letter to the Corinthians? We should be cheerful givers. Oh, that group called again. Let me write my check. You know, we're just moaning and belly aching the whole time, even though we know what good that it's going to. And I'm not talking about your car warranty. <laughs> Some of you get the same robocalls I do, don't you? If I had that many cars, as many times I've been called, a, <laughs> I'd be a car lot. But it's that idea of generosity. It's that idea of being willing to give and being a cheerful giver so that in whatever we do, we do it heartily as unto the Lord. You can be insulted and just let it go. You can be. In fact, that's what Jesus is calling you to do. And if you're still having trouble with that, your heart's the problem. Your heart's the problem. Well, Pastor John, they're really taking advantage of me. Hmm, let's see. How serious do we need to look at being taken advantage of on this earth? Let me call to your memory, your memory Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53, the prophet, centuries before Christ would come, is describing what most would call as the suffering servant. And in our human hearts, we don't like either one of those words. I don't want to suffer, and I don't want to be a servant. Who was the prophet describing? Jesus. Jesus and his time here on earth. So two points I want you to observe there. You're not Jesus. So, so, so don't think, you know, I've taken all the suffering I can take. And God's not calling you to be Jesus. There was only one. And he was uniquely qualified to do what he did. To change our heart. Jesus came to save us, to give us that personal relationship with God the Father. And the description goes something like this. He was despised and rejected by men. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. He had done no violence, neither was there deceit in his mouth. See how that description disqualifies all of us? And yet think still of what Christ willingly went through. He was beaten. He was bruised. We know from the New Testament record, he received a crown of thorns. He was whipped. He was scourged as a Roman punishment. And while you may feel like those kinds of things are happening to you, I want to bring you back to your heart. Where is your heart? Because Jesus took all of that 
for the wrongs that you and I have done. Do you realize that's why he was punished? That's why he was reviled? That's why he was crucified on a Roman cross? He did all of that and had absolutely nothing to do with the wrongs for which he was paying the price. Those are your wrongs. Those are my wrongs. Those are the wrongs of, what's the earth now, more than 7 billion people? Sorry, I stopped keeping count after we stopped having children. And that's tough because it goes straight to the heart. Have you not seen that in all of these passages that Jesus is going straight to the heart? I want to reread what was read earlier. For to this you have been called. It's the Apostle Peter writing to other Christians. For to this you have been called. What have we been called to? You would have called to follow Christ because Christ suffered for you. Leaving you what? It's up there on the screen. An example. Suffering the wrong even when he did no wrong. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued in trusting himself to him. Talking about God who judges justly. So I want to bring it full circle back around. So where's your heart in regards to ultimately trusting God, especially when you are being wronged? See that that immediate grab in your heart of how you're going to respond is what reveals your heart. That's what reveals your heart. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? And I truly want you to bow before God Almighty in a place of trusting Him. He is a God who will judge justly. But before you can ever recognize that, He's got to be the God that changes your heart. How about today? You say, well, John, I I am a Christ follower. I've made that trust and that profession of faith. Well, how about your heart today in regards to vengeance or revenge? Or maybe you're here today and you would say, 